My name is Helena Telezinska and I'm a doctoral student in the Institute of Classical Philology at the University of Warsaw. And I would like to begin today with a short anecdote, so bear with me. The year is 1920 and we are in England, where the famous novelist Arnold Bennett has just published a collection of essays entitled Our Women. Desmond McCarthy, the literary critic, reviewed this collection of essays for the New Statesman under his pen name, The Affable Hawk. In his review, McCarthy agrees with Bennett that women are intellectually inferior to men, in particular when it comes to their creative agencies. This fact, McCarthy says, stares one in the face. This, of course, was not a controversial statement at the time, just over a hundred years ago, so that might have been it. Had it not been for the fact that somebody decided to reply to McCarthy's review, and that somebody was none other but Virginia Woolf. She wrote a letter to the editor of the New Statesman in which she disagreed with McCarthy's and Bennett's view about the intellectual status of women. This letter is wonderful. I encourage all of you to read it. It's witty, it's ironic, it's very clever, and I shan't do it justice here. I shall only focus on one point that is um, of interest to us uh, in this talk. And this point is that when, when Wolf is countering the claim that women are intellectually and creatively inferior to men, and that no women poet has ever been as good as the best male poets, Wolf says that, of course, she doesn't know Greek as well as Mr. Bennett and Affable Hawk do, but she has often been told that Sappho was a woman and that she was praised by Plato and Aristotle and placed by them among the best of the Greek poets. Indeed, Sappho, of course, was the most renowned female poet of ancient Greece and she was praised by many men, including Plato and Aristotle. Or, to be more exact, we have an epigram that is ascribed to Plato in which he says that Sappho is the tenth muse and Aristotle, in his rhetoric, quotes somebody as saying that uh, the inhabitants of Mytilene on Lesbos honored Sappho, although she was a woman. Indeed, the fact that Sappho was a woman and a great poet at the same time seems to have been a little bit problematic for at least some ancient Greeks, just as the idea that a woman could be a great poet seemed problematic for Arnold Bennett and Desmond McCarthy in 1920. And today I would like to focus on one epigram which I think epitomizes this feeling of uneasiness when it comes to women being great poets in a very good way. This epigram, under the very catchy title AP 9.571, which means that it is epigram number 571 from the ninth book of the AP Anthologia Palatina, the Palatine Anthology, which is our 10th a century manuscript and our best source of ancient Greek epigrams. This epigram is anonymous and it is uh, difficult to date, but we think it comes from the end of the Hellenistic period or the beginning of the imperial times. In it, the epigrammatist combines two tropes that were typical when it comes to the reception of Sappho in antiquity. One trope is that she is the tenth muse, which we already saw also in the epigram ascribed to Plato. And the other trope is the so-called canonical list of nine lyric poets. This list, created in Hellenistic times, was a canon of the best lyric poets of uh, ancient Greece, and it included nine people, eight of whom were men, and the ninth person was a woman, of course, Sappho herself. Our epigram in question, begins in a very conventional way by listing the eight male members of the canon of great lyric poets. And then in the last couplet, there's something very interesting. In the last couplet, the epigrammatist says, but Sappho is not ninth among the men, but she is, she is the tenth among the muses. When we look at the Greek, what the epigram says is, andron duk enatesa pho, which means Sappho is not the ninth from among the men or among the men or of the men. And the word for ninth is in ancient Greek, like in Polish, but unlike in English, inflected for case, for number and for gender. 
And the form Enate is a feminine form, rightly so, as it refers to Sappho. And the word Andron, which means of the men or among the men, has a, again a little bit different meaning than in English, where the word man can mean on the one hand a male adult and on the other hand a human being. Now the word aner, of which andron is genitive plural, in the first instance means adult male, as opposed to, for example, an adult female. So we can see in this line a bit of grammatical awkwardness, I think. Translated literally, it would be something like, but Sappho is not the ninth woman among the men. And this roughness, this awkwardness at the grammatical level, I think very well encapsulates the problem with Sappho being a great poet. She is one of the great poets, but at the same time, there is something that al always differentiates her from among the rest of the ordinary, ordinary normal, uh, we could say, from the ancient Greek perspective, male poets. Indeed, even the compliment that she is the tenth muse can be seen as double-edged, as some feminist scholars have argued. On the one hand, it is of course a compliment paid to Sappho because of her great poetic talent. But on the other hand, it says that she is somehow extraordinary. She somehow transcend, transcends the limits of ordinary human experience. It is almost saying that a mortal woman, a normal woman, could not be a great poet. And throughout the reception of Sappho in antiquity and indeed in later times, the fact that she is a woman continues to pose a problem and continues to be a source of uneasiness to her later readers and audiences. So when Desmond McCarthy and Arnold Bennett in 1920 say that women are intellectually and creatively inferior to men, they are in fact continuing a long, long tradition that is there at the very beginning of European civilization and culture. And when Virginia Woolf is arguing with them when she's writing her novels, when she's writing her essays, and when she shows with every word that she writes that women at the very least are equal to men when it comes to intellectual and creative powers, she is also continuing a long tradition, one that goes back all the way to Sappho, who did the unthinkable of being a woman and a great poet at the same time.